We're first going to travel the most traveled path and look at computational approaches to seeing. Um, these are investigations into the relationship between the visual appearance of the world and what goes on in brains, specifically in brains. Um, and it's to be understood that the language used here will employ the computer metaphor freely and speak of information processing. Um, on the slide you can see this shot from Clockwork Orange. Alex is being forced to view certain images. If you haven't seen Clockwork Orange, do watch the movie. But on the, the other side, on the right side of the screen, you can see a fairly typical setup for experimental work done in this vein. Notice that the head is held completely fixed and there's a screen, a fixed distance from the subject. And on that screen, certain images are going to be presented. So that's a strong limitation of this kind of work. We are not studying uh, an active subject. And we'll see that in relational approaches. But here it has the advantage that if we fix the head and change the world by putting something on the screen, for example, we can study what co-varies in the brain. And as we do this, some remarkable work found out that, well, we can immediately see that patterns on the retina show up, as it were, in variation at the back of the brain in the occipital lobe. So something moves across my visual field, causing something to move across my eyeball, and there'll be a small movement across the cells in the occipital lobe. But as we follow that up and dig deeper into the brain, things start to branch and get more complicated. And Milner and Goodale did extensive and very important work here as they followed the changing brain activity from the occipital lobe throughout the rest of the brain. What did they find? Well, they found that you can trace two different streams. Two different, it's almost like information is flowing in two different rivers. One of them goes from the back of the head up over the top, and that's called the dorsal stream. Think of the dorsal fin on a shark, up over the top, like that. The other one starts in the same place, but comes down and around to the sides, just over the ears, a place called the inferior temporal. We'll have a look at that in a minute. These are, this is called a ventral stream. And... The relationship between activity in the dorsal stream and what's going on in the eye is very different from the relationship between activity in the ventral stream and what's going on in the eye. Um, so as we move away from the first site that we can record anything in the brain with regard to vision from the occipital lobe, we're finding aspects of visual perception, which get more complicated, involve knowledge of the world more, combine information from other modalities, importantly the vestibular system, and so on. So let's look at these two streams. The first one, the one that comes up over the top, is called the dorsal stream, and we might think of that as the where stream. It uh, is known to be very sensitive to movement, whether those movements arise from you, which they don't in this experimental situation, or from the world, which they do in this experimental situation. And so whatever's going on here tells us that vision is very involved in moving around in the world and not bumping into things. That's one of the great advantages of having eyes, is that you don't bump into things. So the dorsal stream is concerned with movement. The ventral stream shows us that seeing involves something else as well. We might call this the what stream as well. We know that activity that we record here um, in the brain is related to, as it were, the meaning of what we're looking at and not to movement. That is, to the ability to name things, to recognize things, to pick out things, to recognize faces. Um, so this is a very importantly different job. On the one hand, we have the business of not bumping into things and catching baseballs. And on the other hand, we have the business of, ah, recognizing things and being able to name them. 
So this opens up a whole bunch of questions. One interesting area to look at is the end of this ventral stream down here, which goes down to this part of the brain called the inferior temporal cortex. Here, neuroscientists have been able to record the responses of single neurons, single brain cells, which co-vary as the thing being looked at uh, has some remarkably complicated properties. So you might find a cell that responds selectively to seeing a banana, for example, or to seeing a famous face. So if you go looking around at the organization of these cells here, they have something to do with high level knowledge. And their organization is very opaque to us because we don't understand our organization of high level knowledge. Um, and furthermore, there would be no similarity between what I record in one cell here and what I might record in a cell in your brain. Let's have a look at some of the fascinating things you can see here. Here, for example, there were neuroscientists were recording from a single neuron in inferior temporal cortex in a rhesus macaque monkey. And the way these experiments work is this. You carefully place the most fine possible electrode into the cell. It's a very, very difficult job. It has only been possible for a few decades. And then you hope you can find what this cell is sensitive to. That is, you show the monkey lots and lots of different things, and you just wait and find out, ah, there's something that the cell responds to. And it may, it's guesswork. It's fishing blind. But sometimes you strike lucky, and sometimes you can tell that this cell is responding sensitively to one thing or another. In the top left plot there, you see the recordings from one cell, which, after a lot of trial and error, it was found responded selectively to the face of another monkey seen in profile. Now, if you look at the top, you can see the various uh, visual presentations that were shown to the monkey. That is, it was shown another monkey looking straight at it or another monkey looking to the side. And in the two plots below, you can see that this cell fires a lot or becomes very active only when the monkey is looking at a conspecific from the side. So that's a very specific kind of sensitivity. Down on the bottom right, you see results from a different experiment, different monkey. Once more, an electrode is introduced and we go fishing. We show it bananas and we show it everything under the sun until we find something that this cell responds to. And this cell was found to be responsive to looking at hands. And there's, let's take these different sensitive responses of the cell in turn here from, the, we read the top row from left to right and then the bottom row. When the hand was presented like this, the cell became very, very active. Wonderful. So this is responding to a cell. Once we find that, we can start changing what we show to the monkey and see does the cell still respond. So the hand was turned around like this and the cell still responds. So great, it's sensitive to a hand and it doesn't matter which way the hand is facing. And then the hand, which has lots of detail on it, is replaced by a schematic outline of a hand, a cartoon hand, and the cell still responds. So, great. Something that has the configuration of a hand is of interest to this cell. And then the hand is presented at a different angle, 90 degrees. Completely different in terms of the image on the retina, but this cell is not concerned with images, it's concerned with hands. And so it doesn't care whether the hand is oriented like this or oriented like this, front, back. It's still a good hand. Great. We're finding something out about this cell. Now we show it hands at ever decreasing size and the response goes away. So there's a preferred size to this hand. If you show us a hand that looks smaller because it's further from the monkey, the response is smaller. Now we're finding something. Then we see, okay, well, what does a hand look like to this monkey? So if we replace it with the outline of a mitten, for example, 
and the response just goes away. That's not a hand for this cell. Now we're going to the bottom row. In the bottom row we showed a load of fingers. It didn't like mittens, so we showed fingers that are not organized into a hand, and it's not interested. We show it a crude block-like box with fingers. It's not interested at any size. We show it other things, faces, and all kinds of things, and it's not interested. So, now we've learned a lot about the sensitivity of this one neuron. <laughs> Just this one neuron. We know that it is sensitive to hands at a particular size, irrespective of their orientation. Who owns the hand? That may seem like an impossible question, but it's not. If you ask yourself in your life, which hands regularly appear at a fixed distance from your eyeballs? Your own hands. You do an awful lot with your hands in this kind of space right here, and that seems to be what this is responsive to. So it seems to be a cell that is involved in the monkey's use of its own hands in its own space. So we can find a lot here, and as you dig around in inferior temporal cortex, it's very bewildering because the cells respond to so many different things. We do find similarities between neighboring cells, but the overall organization is somewhat bewildering. Uh, so as we look deeper into the brain, we find cells that are responsive to more and more abstract properties, and less and less, the play of light is less and less relevant. This gave rise to the idea that you might someday find a cell in your brain that responded only to something very specific like your grandmother's face. Uh, that hasn't been found yet, and it's a bit of a misleading way to think about things, but we have found cells which are, whose response is very, very specific, including in one infamous experiment. Some guy had a cell in his brain that responded selectively to images of Jennifer Aniston's face. I have no idea why. Now, so in, inside the brain, we can see that different cells are responsive to different things. Um, some of them have to do with very high-level properties, like the appearance of a face, and some of them to do with low-level properties, like an edge or a, a flash of light. Now, in the arts, in the, sorry, in the science building in UCD, you'll find this picture hanging on the wall. It's Professor Brian Vonson of our physics department, whose image has been altered um, dramatically. While it's hanging upside down, you might not notice that there's something very wrong with this uh, face, but when we turn it the right way up, you sure will. This was first done with an image of Margaret Thatcher's face, which is why it's called the um, the Thatcher effect. So let's just turn that around and oh my god is it grotesque. Look at that. Now we can see what the manipulation done was. It was this has been photoshopped so that the eyes are upside down and the mouth is upside down. Now that was not obvious here, right? We see eyes, we see mouth, we see nose, we see ears. But we're not somehow not putting all those bits together. Whereas when the face is right way up, we put those bits together and the face as a whole pops out. And that this is sort of wired in to the responses of the brain becomes clear when we repeatedly rotate the image. It's grotesque, it's grotesque, it's fine, it's fine. And you might think you would learn to get over this, but you don't. You can sit here, I'm not going to ask you to sit here all day, but if you, if you sat here all day, this image will always be grotesque when it's right way up, always be more or less okay when it's upside down, and the point at which it flips is fixed. So the Thatcher image illustrates something very important, that seeing involves both attention to detail, so we pick out the eyes, we pick out the nose, but also much more high-level stuff, such as recognizing and integrating all these details into a face. That's enough for now, but that's hopefully of some interest.